Welcome to Dependency Injection in Drupal 8. Uh, my name's Kat Bailey. I've been working with Drupal since 2007. And I got involved in core development a little over a year ago, and since then I've been helping out a little with the um, Whiskey Initiative, the, the Web Services and Context Core Initiative. Um, that's the initiative that's been mostly responsible for getting a lot of the um, Symphony components into Drupal Core. Okay. Uh, so just a couple of things before I get started. Um, I will be assuming a rudimentary understanding of object-oriented programming, as in I'll assume you know what I'm talking about when, I, when I'm talking about things like classes and interfaces and constructors. Um, but you know, if the only experience you've had with object-oriented programming is maybe writing custom views handlers or something like that, that's totally fine. The examples would be very simplistic. The other thing I wanted to say is you've probably been hearing about the huge changes in Drupal 8 that are like just so fundamental and just bigger in nature than the kinds of changes you'll have seen between other versions of Drupal. But what I would say is that um, one, one of the major drives with the kinds of changes we've been making is um, towards more standard ways of doing things and uh, getting away from Drupalisms. And certainly with dependency injection, um, learn, you know, you'll have to learn it for Drupal 8, but that's going to stand to you no matter, you know, wherever you, your programming career takes you beyond Drupal 8. <coughs> So what I'm going to cover, I'm um, going to start by looking at dependency injection as a design pattern, as a way of structuring classes, uh, then move on to looking at uh, how frameworks support dependency injection before getting more specific and looking at a symphony style dependency injection and then looking at what, what we're actually doing in Drupal. So the first item there, dependency injection as a design pattern, that's all about why, you know, as in why should you care about dependency injection and what problems does it solve for us? And the rest of it then is all about how, like how, how do frameworks support this? So why dependency injection? Well, normally when the topic of dependency injection is introduced, you'd start off with an example of some object-oriented code where, which isn't doing dependency injection and look at the kinds of problems that can arise. But I thought it made more sense to take a bit of a step back, seeing as we're not all object-oriented programmers here, and just think about what sort of what sorts of common goals we might have when we're writing code. So I think we can probably all agree that when we write code, we want it to be clutter-free, reusable, and testable. Now, what I mean by clutter-free is just, you know, when you're writing a function, you want it to be to the point and not going off on tangents. You don't want to have lines of code that aren't central to what that function is all about. And we'll see some examples of this in a moment. Reusable, obviously, you know, when you go to the trouble of writing a function, uh, to do something awesome, you want to be able to use it over and over again in different contexts. And very closely tied to that, probably the first context you want to use it in is within the context of a test. We want to be able to test the code we write. So we'll start by looking at an example of some procedural code that kind of does it wrong. This is a totally contrived example. It's a very silly function that doesn't do anything interesting. But if you see the first line of the function body there, uh, loads an include file from a module because it knows that it's going to have to, that that's where the function is that it calls on the next line. That module load include, that's an example of clutter. Like it happens to be necessary clutter, but this function isn't in the business of loading files. Um, so that's clutter. Um, as for reusability, uh, obviously this can't be reused outside of the context of a bootstrapped Drupal. Um, and it's very closely tied to whatever this other module does for it. So it's not great, it's not clutter-free, it's not, not easily reusable, and it's not easily testable. Like, if you wanted to test this function, you'd either have to have a bootstrapped Drupal or at least load the file where module load include is defined. So uh, let's now look at the sort of classic example of doing it wrong in object-oriented code. Again, a fairly uh, contrived example. This is a notifier class that we have, and its main sort of thing that it does is the notify method, um, which uh, during the course of whatever it does, it uses it sends an email, and it uses an emailer object to send that email. And how it gets that, you see in its constructor, it instantiates one for itself. At first glance, it doesn't look like there's an awful lot of clutter going on here, but um, that line where it's instantiating a mailer object, that new mailer, we could see that as clutter, because 
you know, this class should not be in the business of loading and, and knowing how to instantiate a mailer object. Because, you know, what if it's not that simple? Maybe the mailer actually takes various parameters. Um, and if those parameters change, like if anything about the mailer class changes, well, then this class is going to have to change accordingly. So we say that it's tightly coupled to the mailer class. And that's bad. Um, in terms of reusability then, uh, you know, what if you wanted, you didn't want to use the mailer class as the class that sends the email, you wanted to use something else. Um, and then obviously testability, right, you would prefer to use a mock mailer, something that's not actually going to send an email. But here we don't have a choice, uh, we're being forced, it, it's, it's going to instantiate a mailer object whether we like it or not. So what can we do about it? Um, the only difference here, you'll see, rather than instantiating a mailer in its constructor, it takes one as its constructor parameter. And uh, so now it doesn't need to know how to instantiate the mailer. Now it's worth just transitioning back and seeing the difference between that, instantiating the thing in its constructor, and that, receiving it as a constructor parameter. That's dependency injection, all right? That's all it is. Uh, so, like, as one guy put it in a blog post I read recently, dependency injection is a $25 term for a five cent concept. <laughs> like, you're just passing the object its instance variables as constructor parameters, or if you want to be really fancy about it, you're injecting it with its dependencies. So, here I've just put the calling code at the bottom, so the thing that's going to instantiate the notifier, first it's going to instantiate a mailer object, and then it passes that into the con constructor. So if we reframe this in terms of the goals that we had about writing code that's clutter-free, reusable, and testable, another way of thinking about that is we want to write code that's ignorant. Why ignorant? So the less your code knows, the more reusable it is. And if you think about it, the more your code knows, like the more it knows about other classes and how to instantiate those classes, um, the more dependent it is that that knowledge that it has uh, stays the same. And that's that tight coupling that we want to get away from. So let's look at this again and think, well, what does the notifier class really need to know about the thing that it's going to use to send the email? Does it even know, need to know what the concrete class is that gets injected into it? It doesn't. All it needs to know is that it's going to get a thing on which it can call the send method and pass these parameters. And so the way we express that is it'll accept anything that implements the mailer interface. So now at the bottom you can see instead of instantiating a mailer object, we, uh, we use a special mailer and pass that in instead. So that is constructor injection, one form of dependency injection. Um, so the calling code at the bottom is injecting the mailer into the notifier, and you can see the constructor at the top is expressing its dependency on anything that implements the mailer interface. So dependency injection is about de declaratively expressing dependencies in the class definition rather than instantiating them in the class itself. So it's about having classes that are just kind of saying like, I need these things to do my job, so, you know, you're going to have to call me with my dependencies if you want me to do anything. Constructor injection is not the only form of dependency injection. It's the most common, and it's certainly by far the most common that we use in, in Drupal, but there are some other forms. Uh, another common form is setter injection. So, with setter injection, rather than injecting things in the constructor, here we have a setter method, set mailer, that ex again accepts anything that implements the mailer interface. And so your calling code, after instantiating the object, will need to call the set mailer uh, method and pass in the dependency. So that's setter injection. Uh, there's also interface injection, which is very similar to setter injection. It's just that for every setter method that you have for a dependency, that's, um, there's an interface for that. So it's like the class basically declares itself as being mailer injectable, for example. Um, it's very verbose because for every setter method you, you need to have um, an interface and it's not very common. I don't think there are, are any frameworks that actually support interface injection. Um, you'll often hear dependency injection referred to as inversion of control. These two terms are synonymous and 
I don't know about you, but when I first heard that, it wasn't immediately clear to me why, uh, why it was called inversion of control. I mean, I could, I saw there was some kind of inversion going on, but it wasn't crystal clear until I read one particular explanation of it, which uh, I've illustrated here. So traditionally, you might have a library of classes that your code makes use of. So your code is going to call out and instantiate objects from that library of classes. And in this setup, the library is passive. It's just kind of sitting there going, here's some classes that you can use if you like. Um, and your code is the active party. It's actively calling out and instantiating objects from those classes. But with dependency injection, the framework is, going to, is the active party, and it's going to call your code with its dependencies. So again, your, your code this time now is, is passive and saying, like, I need to be called with my dependencies if I'm going to do my job. So that's the sense uh, in which uh, control is inverted here. And inversion of control is often referred to as the Hollywood principle, because um, as they say in Hollywood, don't call us, we'll call you. Now, that, you know, if you take away nothing else from this talk, uh, apart from what, what I've covered so far, which I hope won't be the case, but if it is, uh, it's not the end of the world, because that really is the most important part. Like, that, that's why we care about dependency injection. You know, we've created this class that's decoupled, you know, it's clutter-free, it's reusable, and it's really easy to test. Um, and the rest of the talk is about how, how frameworks support that, but obviously the how is completely irrelevant if you don't understand the why. So now that we have, now we have our classes all nicely decoupled from each other, um, declaratively expressing their dependencies, the question arises, I mean, I've put that calling code down there at the bottom, but where does that go, all right? In other words, where does injection actually happen? So, the first option is the most, the most obvious, like uh, manual injection, which is just like the code that we just saw, the calling, calling code that actually instantiated the mailer and injected it into uh, the notifier. Um, but, you know, th does that belong in a class somewhere? Then that class is responsible for knowing how to instantiate the uh, dependencies for the notifier, etc. And you can imagine in the context of a framework um, where you, you want to support um, different implementations for dependencies, et cetera. So, so that doesn't really work very well. Another option is to use a factory. Um, a factory is just a class that's responsible for instantiating objects of a particular kind. Um, but you know, you'd, you'd end up needing, either needing a separate factory class or, or needing a bunch of logic to um, deal with every possible object graph you could possibly want to instantiate. And by object graph, I just mean um, different concrete implementations like f for the dependencies and, their, and the dependencies of the dependencies, etc. So what frameworks do to support dependency injection is they use what's called uh, a container or an injector. Actually, it goes by various names. So dependency injector or a dependency injection container, um, also known by its charming acronym, which in fairness is the easiest way to refer to it. Uh, the shortest way to refer to it anyway. Um, or it's also called an IOC container for inversion of control, uh, or a service container, and I'll explain why service container in a moment. But basically, uh, what it does, it assumes responsibility for constructing your object graphs, so instantiating your classes with their dependencies. Uh, it uses configuration data to know how to do this, and it allows infrastructure log logic to be kept separate from application logic. So why this word services? Um, so you need to forget about uh, web services or services module for a moment. Um, a service is just an object that provides some kind of globally useful functionality. Um, that's ex best explained within an example. So here's some examples of services. A cache backend, for example. You can imagine using a cache backend in your own code where you just you want to say, get me something from the cache. Or similarly with a logger, you would use a logger to just log stuff and you don't want to know anything about how a logger works, you just want to use it. Um, a mailer, obviously, as we've seen, uh, and a URL generator is another example. Here are some things that are definitely not services. These are data objects, right? A product, a blog post, an email message. 
So that should give you some idea of what we're talking about when we're talking about services, and we're not talking about data objects like this. So I found this nice uh, diagram in a book on dependency injection, which I think gives a nice kind of simple overview of how things work together. Um, but I've added my own personal touch to it, because basically there are three things you need to be aware of when you're working with a dependency injection container. The first is classes, and by that I'm just referring to what we've already talked about. This is the fact that you have this, all your classes are nicely decoupled from each other and they're just declaratively expressing their dependencies. Um, and then, but the classes don't know anything about the container. They don't know that they're going to be instantiated by a container. They're just regular classes. Um, then there's configuration, which gets fed into the container. And the configuration consists of service definitions, all right? So for each, each service has an identifier. And then the definition consists of, uh, or specifies which class to instantiate for that service and what its dependencies are. And so, that, so the dependencies will then be references to other services. So you can imagine when the injector or the container gets asked for a particular service, um, that it's going to look up what class to instantiate. It's going to see if it has dependencies. If it has dependencies, it'll go, go and instantiate those first. But they might have dependencies as well, et cetera, et cetera. So you can imagine there's this kind of viral injection that, that happens um, once a particular service is requested. And then the third piece of the puzzle is understanding the, the application flow. Like, how does the application even interact with the container? Because obviously, the, the regular code we write isn't going to know about the container at all, and it shouldn't. But at some point, like at the entry point to the application, uh, there's going to have to be, first of all, it's going to have to instantiate this container thing, and it's going to have to ask it for services. So understanding um, how that sort of, that flow works uh, is important too. So once you have your classes all um, loosely coupled and uh, declaratively expressing their dependencies, the rest of it is all about getting wired in. Uh, you talk about getting wired into the container. So I'm just showing some example configuration. Um, most frameworks support XML-based configuration. This is a kind of made-up um, sample. It's loosely based on um, a Java spring. Uh, Java framework called Spring. And so here we're just specifying where we've got three services. Each of them has an ID. And um, you can see two of them have constructor arguments that reference other services. So you can imagine you know, you'd have a huge, big, long list of these services, each with an ID, and they could be referencing other services and basically saying, I need that other service in order to do my thing. So this is pretty typical of um, an XML-based configuration for a dependency injection container. So how it works, uh, again, service keys uh, map to service definitions. The definitions specify which class to instantiate and what its dependencies are. And then those dependencies are specified as references to other services using their keys. And at the end of the day, the container is an object, right? So you're gonna, there'll be some method that needs to be called on it to, to ask it for a particular service by passing in the, the key. Uh, scope is uh, something that's used. Um, this idea is common to most dependency injection frameworks. Um, and scope just refers to the context under which the service key refers to the same instance. So for example, each time a request is made for a particular service, should it instantiate a new object each time, or should it always give you the same instance? And different frameworks have different default scopes, um, as we'll see shortly. So Symfony has a dependency injection component. Um, this is a standalone component that can be used in various frameworks. So it's used in the Symfony full stack framework, and it's used in Drupal 8. And what the component is is a bunch of classes, including the container class itself, and then various supporting classes for like loading configuration and all that stuff. A um, couple of things to note about how Symfony does dependency injection. Uh, it uses string keys, which is um, fairly typical, but there are other ways of, of identifying services. This is just the sim this is a very simple way of you can just use an arbitrary string. Um, obviously, most frameworks will have some kind of naming conven convention for how to um, name services. And then, um, in addition to being able to specify the class for a particular service and what its dependencies are, 
Um, you can also specify additional methods to be called um, on the object once it has been instantiated. Um, and that comes in pretty handy, as we'll see shortly. In Symfony, the default scope is container scope, meaning for the lifetime of the container, uh, unless you specify otherwise when you're defining a service, then for the lifetime of the container, it's going to, the same instance will be returned each time that service is requested. Um, so if you wanted it to be a new instance each time, you'd have to specify prototype scope. Um, it can be configured in PHP via an API where like, you just make, PHP, you make API, API calls to register services to the container. Or you can use XML, similar to what we saw. Uh, and you can also use YAML. And the container can be compiled down to plain PHP. Uh, and in order to understand what the hell that's all about, we need to look into some Symfony terminology. Now, I almost feel I need to apologize for this part of the talk because, um, you know, I, I was saying we're getting rid of Drupalisms, yay, but now you have to learn all these Symfonyisms. Um, but the good news is, like most of the code you write, the regular code that you write in your lovely decoupled classes, won't need to know anything about Symfony or Symfonyisms at all. This is just for understanding how your classes can get wired into the container. So, what's this compiling business? Well, you can imagine that um, if we're parsing these configuration files to find out about service de definitions, it's going to be very, ex if you've got a lot of services, it's going to be really expensive to do that on every request. So Symfony allows us to parse it once or parse when necessary, as in whenever that configuration changes, and then dump out the result of that into uh, a PHP class. So it actually writes out a PHP class, um, hard coding a method for each service definition for each service. And what that looks like, um, so this would be the class that actually got written out by Symfony during its uh, compiling phase. Um, and in this case, it obviously only found one service, um, and it was the example service. So it wrote a method for that called get example service. And what that'll do is it'll just return a new instance of some class. So that's, a, that's what the compiled container looks like. Synthetic services, um, these are just services that the container doesn't actually know how to instantiate itself. But um, if something gets instantiated outside of the container, the container can still be told about it. So um, if anything else expresses a dependency on that thing, it knows it can just pass this, this object to it. Compiler passes. Uh, this is all about modifying existing definitions of services. Um, so compiler passes are classes that you can use to process the container and change what's in there. Um, so an obvious use case would be if you want to actually change the class that gets instantiated for a given service. Um, say you, know, you had the cache backend service or something and the default one used a database and you wanted to switch it out and make sure it uses the one that had a memcache or whatever you could just change the class that was used. Um, and then another common use is um, what are called tagged services. Now, what are they? So tagging, you can just add arbitrary tags when you define your services. And all that is, is you're just, it's just some way that you can then flag certain services for some kind of processing, which you do in a compiler pass. And this is used, for example, uh, to register event subscribers to Symfony's event dispatcher. Bundles. I, uh, I mentioned these reluctantly um, for obvious reasons. Uh, we already have a type of bundle in core, um, and now we have this other one. Basically, bundles are Symfony's answer to um, plugins or modules, uh, prepackaged sets of functionality implementing a particular feature. And each bundle includes a class implementing the bundle interface, which allows it to interact with the container, for example, to add compiler passes. Now, the only reason I mention it at all is because we kind of use Symfony's uh, bundle idea in core um, just for the ability to allow third-party extensions, i.e. modules, to provide that class that can then interact with the container um, and modify existing services. <coughs> 
Now, it's worth going off on a little bit of a tangent to look at the event dispatcher. This is actually a separate component. It's not part of the dependency injection component in Symfony. It's a separate Symfony component, and we use it in, in Drupal core. And the reason it's worth looking at is not only because it's a good illustration of all that stuff about compiler passes and tagging, but um, it's, it also plays a very important role in the application flow. So if you remember that, that diagram with the three things uh, of how everything ties in together, so understanding the application flow and how the application interacts with the container, event dispatcher, uh, the event dispatcher plays a very key role there. So what it is, I mean, it's basically, it's a very similar mechanism to, uh, it's an alternative to Drupal's hooks system. Um, so this dispatcher dispatches events. Um, those could be events around uh, the handling of a request, uh, but it can be used to dispatch any kind of custom event you want to make up. Um, event listeners are registered to the dispatcher, so it then knows, it notifies them when a particular event uh, takes place. And then event subscribers are, they, th those are just classes that provide a whole bunch of listeners. So each listener is a method um, in this event subscriber class. Um, and it's, so it basically is able to tell the dispatcher that for, a for certain events, these are its listeners. Um, so a compiler pass is used to do that, to register all event subscribers to the dispatcher using their service IDs. And it, it does that using tagging. It tags them. You, you tag a service as an event subscriber, and that means during this compiler pass process, um, it'll get added to the dispatcher. And the dispatcher actually holds a reference to the container, which means if it's given service IDs, it can, it can get those services from, um, from the container. So it can instantiate these subscriber services with their dependencies. Now, I have that in inverted commas because when you think about it, sub event subscribers, they're not really services in the strict sense. They're not like what I defined earlier as um, objects that provide some kind of globally useful functionality. Um, they're not going to be used by something else. But they are, they're, they're services purely in the sense that they are wired directly into the container. And that's just all key in the, that sort of um, application flow and how things get kicked off in terms of that um, sort of viral injection of dependencies. Okay, so this and, and the next slide are as nitty gritty as it's going to get, I promise. Um, just showing you what, uh, this is actually Drupal 8 code. Um, this is that compiler pass class where uh, the um, event subscribers get registered to the dispatcher. So, um, the class implements the compiler pass interface, which is just that one method for processing the container and doing whatever modifications you want to do. So in this case, we want to modify the event dispatcher. And the way we're modifying it is we're basically specifying that for every service that has been defined with uh, the event subscriber tag, we need the container to call a particular method on the dispatcher after instantiating it. And so it's going to call the add subscriber service method. Um, so that's an example of this, um, the fact that Symfony lets you specify additional methods to call after instantiating a service. And that's how it's used. And how the actual compiler pass gets registered or gets added to the container um, is using this bundle mechanism. So um, we have this core bundle uh, which um, we use to add compiler passes for various things. So now that we've seen some actual Drupal code, it's time to talk about dependency injection in Drupal 8. Um, so Drupal 8 has a dependency injection container, obviously. Um, it provides a whole bunch of services, some common ones that you will definitely be uh, using. Uh, the default database connection is a service. Uh, there's a service called the module handler, which you'll need, uh, you'll need that if you want to invoke hooks in other modules or do anything that requires knowledge of um, enabled modules. The HTTP request object is also a service, but that's an example of a synthetic service, right? That doesn't actually get instantiated by the container. It gets, the, the con container just gets told about it so that it, other things can depend on the request service. Uh, this is a bit of a wall of text. I just wanted to show an example of the configuration for the container in Drupal. So we use YAML. Uh, 
And uh, this is just an extract from the core.services.yaml file where all of core's services are defined. Um, if you skip down to the last one, path.aliasmanager, um, and just so we specify what class to instantiate for the alias manager and then what its dependencies are. Um, so these are just the constructor arguments to pass and each one of those is a reference to one of the previous services. Um, the at symbol is just how we tell the container this thing is a reference to an existing service. So it'll know then to instantiate those other services first before instantiating the alias manager. And I just wanted to show, this is Alias Manager's constructor. I'm showing it just to kind of point out that like the Alias Manager itself doesn't know anything about the container. Um, it's just saying like it needs a database connection, it needs something called an alias whitelist, and something else called a language manager, and as long as it gets those things, it's happy. So if you want to use any of the services provided by Core, um, you've got a couple of options. The first is if you're stuck in the land of procedural code, you can use a helper. So it's a static method on the Drupal class um, where you just ask for some service, uh, specifying it by its key. That's not the preferred method. Um, that's essentially a kind of an anti-pattern known as um, service locator where you actually you know about the container, and um, so that means in order to be able to do anything with it, you need to know the names of actual services. And we don't want our code to know the names of actual services, right? That ties our code to the container itself, and we want to get away from that. So the preferred option is to write object-oriented code and get wired into the container. Now, uh, this diagram quite possibly breaks all kinds of rules in terms of uh, diagrams. It was just my attempt to um, somehow get across in as simplistic a way as possible what the actual application flow is in Drupal, like how, how does um, the container get instantiated, etc. So basically what happens is index.php um, instantiates this thing called the Drupal kernel and asks it to handle a request. Um, the Drupal kernel doesn't actually know how to handle a request, but it knows how to build, um, how to construct the dependency injection container. Um, so it does that, and that's, you know, on a regular page request, that's going to be just instantiating that, um, that hard-coded class that we saw where everything has, so it's just a class that has a bunch of methods that know how to return objects for services. So once it has instantiated the container, it asks it for a thing called the HTTP kernel service, because um, the HTTP kernel is what knows how to handle a request. So um, it gets that from the container and then uh, passes off handling of the request. And the HTTP kernel has a couple of dependencies. One of them is our friend, the event dispatcher, and the other is a thing called a controller resolver. So with the event dispatcher, as we already saw, it already knows what all of the um, listeners are that listen to particular events. So when the request is being handled, the, one of the first uh, things that happens is the dispatcher dispatches the request event, basically just saying, does anything out there want to react to the fact that this request has come in? You know, maybe make some changes to the request itself. Um, so obviously one way that things get hooked in is, is as these um, event subscriber services and they will get instantiated with their dependencies by the dispatcher itself. And then the other way, and probably the more common way that you will end up interacting with the container is code for a particular page. So in, um, with Symfony, we, we don't have page callbacks anymore. We have the equivalent, which is um, we have this new routing system which matches a path to a route which specifies a controller, and the controller is just the actual page callback for that particular path. Um, so the controller resolver's job is just to find what the controller is for, for that route. And so in a moment we'll see how you can get hooked in, um, you know, how, how your controller can get hooked in, and why I have a question mark around uh, whether it should be a service. But first, just a quick look at how you would get wired in as an event, uh, as an event subscriber. First thing is you would need to implement the event subscriber interface. There's just uh, one method in this interface, which is a static method, where you tell, you're basically telling the dispatcher what events you want to listen to. So in this case, it's saying it wants to listen to the request event 
And the method that should fire on that event is the on-kernel request method, um, which refers to one of its own methods, and that, that method will be called um, in that event. So that's the interface that needs to be implemented to, do, to hook in. And then the other thing is that it will need to get defined as a service, and the service will need to uh, be tagged as an event subscriber. And uh, so one uh, example of this is, for example, the um, path subscriber, which is responsible for uh, resolving the request path to a system path. So it's, uh, it subscribes to the request event, uh, looks at one of the attributes of the request, and then you know, it has a dependency on the alias manager to look that up and convert it to a system path. But as I said, you're more likely to, to be interested in getting hooked in for code that, that should run on a particular page. So how do you get your controller wired in? So controllers obviously are gonna have dependencies on services, you know, like the database and various other things. Um, but whether they should themselves be directly wired into the container is quite a hotly debated topic in the Symfony community. So like the core Symfony guys um, are against the idea of controllers themselves being services, whereas the Symfony CMF guys, it's another framework built on top of Symfony components, um, they think controllers should be services. Uh, in Drupal, our feeling was that they should not be. I mean, one main reason is when you think about it, you're gonna have an awful lot of controllers, right? Controllers are your page callbacks. And if every single one of those is a service, you're gonna have this, your service container is just gonna be a huge, big bloated thing full of services that are really just for glue code because your controller should really just be about matching the route to the code that needs to run. So I think it's supported, you can, your, your controllers can be wired in directly as services, but it's not the recommended way. The recommended way is to implement um, an interface it's the controller interface, I believe, and it's just one method, a static factory method, and that factory method accepts the entire container and can use it then to pull out services and instantiate the, the controller with whatever services it needs. Uh, an excellent example of this in core is book module, so have a look at that. Um, and there's also uh, really great documentation explaining um, how book module was converted to use the new routing system and how the um, how book module's controller um, gets its dependencies in injected. Uh, first rule of dependency injection containers, don't inject the container ever unless you absolutely must. And so the thinking behind that is basically, once you inject the container into one of your classes, your class is then coupled to the container. It, the only way it can do anything with it is if it knows about service IDs. And why would you want your class to have that kind of knowledge? So the only time you'd ever have a class that has the container as a dependency is if that is just part of your infrastructure logic. So not your normal code for, um, you know, that does the regular stuff. Um, just the code that, that is part of the framework itself, really. Um, for those curious who want to actually dive in and look at, in the Drupal 8 code base and see where all this is happening, um, so where the, I've, I've just listed you know, where, you, where you can find this stuff, so where the Drupal kernel is, where the services are defined, um, where this bundle thing is, which may not always be called a bundle. We may, we may get to change that um, in time, we'll see. Because uh, it's, as I said, it's just about allowing modules to modify the container in some respect. And then uh, where the compiler passes are. Core has a number of compiler passes, including the one for registering um, uh, event subscribers. And then for your modules, if you want to, um, you know, write some nice decoupled classes and have them wired into the container, um, you know, if you want to define them as services, you'll have a YAML file for them. And then um, you'll need, if, only if you, want to, if you want to use that compiler path mechanism, you'll need a, a bundle class as well for your module. Um, and all classes, including compiler path classes, um, need to live in a particular directory. Now that's just tied into our, um, the PSR0 standard that we're using for um, namespacing classes so that our, our autoloader knows how to, where to find them. So that's uh, basically all I wanted to show you about dependency injection, but I wanted to finish off really quick um, just uh, 
to talk about testability because we now have PHP unit in core, which is a really awesome um, unit testing framework. And so that in conjunction with using dependency injection um, makes for really easy testability. Now this has nothing to do with the container at all, so you can forget about that for this. This is just about having lovely decoupled classes and a lovely testing framework to test them with. So there's just one thing I wanted to cover with it, which is the ability to create test doubles or stubs. So say one of your classes has a dependency on something. The language, ma language manager is a good example because it's a bit of a gnarly one. I think it still calls out to procedural functions. And um, if anyone was in Marks on a Bomb's talk earlier this morning about, uh, you know, we, we can't have that kind of thing, those kinds of hidden dependencies in unit tests because these procedural functions probably end up calling out to looking for database connections and all kind of horrible things can happen. So we don't want to instantiate the actual language manager. We're just trying to test a class that needs, that has a dependency on the language manager. So instead we can create a stub of it and PHP unit provides these helper methods for, um, for creating these. Uh, so the get mock method, you just tell it what class Is it safe? Move closer to it. That would be helpful. Move closer to it? Okay. Is that all right now? How's that? Is it even on? I don't think it's. Oh. How's that? Okay. Right, so uh, PHP unit allows us to create um, stubs of things just by specifying what the class is, and then you can just tell it what behavior you want it to exhibit um, in the, when you're using it. The point here is we're not interested in testing the language manager class itself. We just know that the class we are testing needs a language manager or needs something that it thinks is a language manager and is going to behave the way the language manager would behave. So we just tell it to behave in a certain way. And in this case, we're saying, if the get language method gets called on this class, it should return uh, this a standard class object with these properties uh, representing the um, English language. So that's a very straightforward use of um, this get mock uh, method that's provided by PHP unit. Here's a slightly more complex one. If we wanted to mock the alias manager, so as we saw, the alias, alias manager has a bunch of dependencies, one of which is the dependency, or which is the uh, database connection, um, and then a couple of other things. And but well, we just want to pass in an alias manager to the class that we're testing and know that it's going to behave the way it should. So we disable the original constructor um, when we're get, when we're creating a mock for this. And uh, below there, we're specifying how we want it to respond to the get system path method call. And we're using a value map, and that allows us to say, if get system path is called with the value with the parameter foo, then return user slash one. If it gets called with the parameter bar, then slash, uh, return node slash one. So that makes for like really really uh, tests that are just a joy to write when you can use this stuff. Um, because and and it's because you've decoupled your classes from each other, and you know um, you can just pass in these stubs, and it all works beautifully. And the best thing about it is it's really really fast. So I'm just going to. We don't have that many um, unit tests uh, converted to PHP unit yet in core, but um, I'm just going to run them there anyway. Like. Uh, it's so like 165 tests and it took two seconds. And you know, if you're familiar with watching, um, using simple test and you know how long a single web test takes to run because it's like installing the whole system and everything. Just because some procedural function somewhere uh, is expecting a database to exist. And we don't need that for the vast majority of the code that we want to test. Um, so PHP unit is awesome. Um, Okay, I've just uh, I've put up a list of resources. Um, basically, there's all kinds of further reading you can do, um, sort of general stuff about dependency injection, and then um, 
I've put links to um, Symphony-specific stuff and then Drupal 8-specific documentation. Um, and, oh yes, one other thing to mention, like by far the best way to get really comfortable with this stuff is to um, help in the ongoing effort to convert Drupal um, to using all of this, because we're by no means completely there yet. Um, so, and, and this would stand you in really good stead when it comes time to um, converting your own modules to Drupal 8. So uh, come along to the sprint on Friday and help out. And now I'd like to open it up to questions. Oh yeah, anyone who has a question, you need to go and stand at the mic there, please. Hello. Hi. Uh, thank you for your awesome talk. Uh, very informative. You're a great instructor. <laughs> So this isn't necessarily related directly to dependency injection, but the topics you covered today, um, you know, I, I feel like this is kind of like a really jaw-dropping kind of moment, even though this has been happening over the past months and the whole D8 build and everything. But how do you think this is going to affect the technical part of the Drupal community um, in terms of size? Or I was just thinking about it, listening and following along. So what do you think? Do you mean uh, in terms of the fact that we are, we're moving towards more standard ways of doing things? And Well, like, yeah, I mean, the hope is that, um, you know, developers who have been working on other PHP projects or, you know, who are familiar at least with PHP but not with Drupal won't be scared off because we're getting rid of, like, these real special ways we have of doing things and we're, we're using um, sort of best practices and what the rest of the world is doing. So, yeah, my hope is that it's going to have a very positive effect on the technical part of the community. Thanks. So this may be a dumb question, but it may not be. Um, does this, how does this affect like hooks? Do we, are we replacing hooks with events or are hooks still a, a concept we're gonna be handling? That is definitely not a dumb question. Um, some hooks have been replaced with events. Um, and there is in fact an issue ongoing that uh, CHX is working on, um, which would basically support uh, it would basically, I think, support leaving hooks in place, but essentially have them fire as, as events. Um, I, I haven't been following it too closely, but um, I mean, the, the simple answer is no, hooks haven't gone away yet, not by a long shot. Um, but uh, certainly some, some things have been converted to events. As a follow-up question, sure. how does one know, other than you know, strapping your boots on and jumping into it, what's a hook and what actually needs to be sort of more object-oriented? Uh, like when do you pick one versus another in the in the new paradigm? Well, everything will. I mean, everything should be documented. So if sure. the hook, you know, look at api.drupal.org, and um, I I haven't seen um, if this is the case, but like if something that has been a hook through Drupal five, Drupal six, Drupal seven, and so long, and and then no longer exists in Drupal eight, I'm pretty sure there'll be a link to what the um, equivalent way of doing it is in Drupal eight. I think I I'm not totally certain. Much appreciated. Thanks. Oh yeah, go to drupal.org slash list changes and you'll see. Thank you for that terrific talk. I, if you'll permit me, I want to make an announcement about something that's totally unrelated. Sure. Uh, I just came from a FEMA conference call where they are talking about uh, emergency disaster response to the Oklahoma tornado. And so uh, a bunch of people are trying to organize a code sprint tonight uh, starting at 7.30 at Coder's Lounge where we're going to work on building some apps that FEMA, that would really help FEMA's disaster response for the tornado victims in Oklahoma. So anyone who's interested, 7.30 tonight, Coder's Lunch. Okay, thanks, Brian. Hi, um, this isn't really about dependency injection, and it's a really basic level question, so hope it's okay. But um, you mentioned, like, with our modules, if we wanted to hook into this, and you actually gave the path name where our where we would put our information. So I don't know if you're able to get back to that slide or not. But the path thing that you gave was something like my module slash something, and then I think slash Drupal, then slash my module, and then 
So, um, yeah. The, yeah, my module slash live slash Drupal slash my module slash my module bundle dot PHP. So my question is, once we're within my module, I mean, I can understand like why if you want live slash Drupal, but then why do we put my module again after that? <laughs> Okay, so there's a, a huge, big debate raging uh, in a particular um, issue somewhere on Drupal.org about that very question. Um, you know, I, I, this is the way our namespaces are registered currently. So we have an autoloader and we basically tell it about these particular namespaces. So for each module that's enabled, it knows about the lib Drupal slash my module namespace. So it, when it finds a class that's within that namespace, it knows what directory it's in. Um, get involved in the big raging debate. Uh, <laughs> I don't really, you know, I can't really say any more about it. Okay. How would um, this, um, so how, how would you deal with cross-service dependency? You know, service A says I need service B and service B says I need service A. That's just a bad design. Well, I mean, there are ways. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, I mean, there not. are ways of, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes there, you know, circular dependency, it, like, just happens to be necessary. And there are various ways around that, um, like uh, using proxies and this kind of thing. But uh, I, I don't think there's any, anything specific in, a, in the dependency injection container that knows how to, in fact, I'm pretty sure you can't have circular dependencies in the dependency injection container. Um, I have been doing some uh, page conversions yesterday during the code sprint. Great. Um, I have been using like a lot of controller classes and there are so many of them. How do you decide which one is the correct one to use for the router conversion? Because there are so many of them. Another question is why do we use uh, dependency injection through the Symfony component? And the third question is what the services.yml file in the plugins um, do for the module? So uh, the first question about controller, uh, which controller to? Um, so I was just like, for example, user underscore page, um, converting that uh, hook menu to the new router uh, for the Drupal 8. And then we, were, we, we have been using like a lot of controller classes like Drupal uh, core and then controller and bunch of the classes name. I, I don't know, I've been told like just to follow the example and do the conversion because I'm trying to learn. Okay, well, I, I'm sorry that you were told just to follow the example, um, and I'm also sorry that I don't know the actual answer to that question. I haven't been involved in, in these conversions. Um, the best person to talk to is probably Larry Garfield and ask him, um, and don't accept being fobbed off and told to follow the instructions. <laughs> uh, sorry, what was the second question? Um, Why the are we The second question is, are we still using dependency, or I don't know about that, uh, but do we use the dependency injection through the Symfony component? Yeah, we use Symfony's dependency injection component. Um, and so it provides the classes, like it provides the container class. And, um, you know, in, in certain cases, we're probably overriding some of the Symfony stuff by uh, subclassing it. But it's, yeah, it's the Symfony dependency injection component that's powering and, all of this. Okay. And third question is what um, services YAML file in the plugin uh, directory do for the module? What is the services YAML file? Yeah. Uh, so that's where you actually define the services. Um, so each service has an ID, and uh, you specify which class, which like actual concrete implementation. Um, you know, you specify the class to instantiate for that particular service. Thank you. Okay. So this is related to the question um, about, about the screen you, you went back to. Um, suppose I'm writing a module, and I want to um, you know, take, take some existing JavaScript library or some existing PHP library and, and provide a wrapper for it with my module. Uh, wouldn't I then put files under my module lib and then vendor and then whatever library I'm importing? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, I'm not actually sure what the, uh, um, what you're supposed to do in that case, uh, whether it's a vendor. I, it probably is a vendor directory that you need. I don't know, Mark, do you want to speak to that? And there's a talk about Composer, right? I don't know if that's happened yet, but um, 
Rob Loach and Larry Garfield are going to be talking about Composer. Okay, but, but I guess what I'm trying to get at is, is it, uh, an, another answer to the question that was asked earlier, and I, and I think the idea is that you're supposed to ignore the my module part and, and lib slash Drupal is the same whether it's in my module or your module and, and there can be other things inside it like lib vendor. So Am I right? Okay, thank you. You mentioned um, controller resolvers, and um, I'm sorry, but I kind of went, my, my eyes glazed over because all I could hear was struts. So, <laughs> but I didn't see an example of one. Did you, did you show one? I didn't show a controller resolver. There is one okay. controller resolver. Like the controller resolver is just responsible for finding the controller for that particular route. Um, okay. But do you, uh, I didn't show an example of a controller either. But uh, I pointed to, if you look at book module in core, okay. that's a really good example um, of how, how that gets um, wired okay. into the It's computer. not like struts though, right? Sorry? It's not like struts though, right? Uh, I have no idea. OK. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go look at struts. Okay. <laughs> okay, I think that's everything. Thanks very much.